Hey, Backstrode, thank you so much for joining us here on Wednesday night. We've got another great service lined up for you. We've got Pastor Frank Curry giving his second sermon in the Galatians series and for us as a church, so super excited to hear that. Also, we've got Phil and crew uh, leading us in worship, and so we're excited for that. I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to get right into it. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you that we are wrapping up our series here next week in the book of Galatians. I pray for Pastor Frank as he gives the message that you would bless that, Father, that we would humble ourselves uh, in view and in hearing your word, Father, that we would not be afraid to be challenged by it. And I also want to pray for everything that's going on in our country right now, Father. Um, it, it is challenging and it's hard and it's scary, but I pray for us as we seek to understand each other and dialogue and talk and everything that's going on, Father, that you would provide, Father, that you would hear and, and, and that we would be understanding and gracious and, and that we would look to you for safety and all those things, Father. So thank you for uh, the way you provide for us, even in a pandemic, even in unrest in the nation, even in hard questions and dialoguing about hard situations, Father. Thank you for your provision. I pray these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Every song we could ever sing 
Good evening, Baxterites. Thank you for joining us once again for our Wednesday night service and our continued study of the book of Galatians. You know, even though this book was not written to us, it was certainly written for us, and the message and lessons in it are very much applicable to us today. Paul has taught us throughout this letter that the truth of the gospel and the grace of God changes us from the inside out by transforming our hearts, our thinking, and our approach to absolutely everything. The gospel message that Paul communicates is that even though we are more wicked than we ever dared to believe, we are more loved and accepted by Christ than we ever dared hope. And the thought came to me about our own Declaration of Independence and how we as Americans value and treasure it because of the freedom that it brings to us as Americans. And I just believe that the Galatians had to feel that same empowerment upon hearing about their freedom in Christ. There is nothing more exhilarating as knowing that our past is forgotten and that new freedom awaits. People yearn to be free. And Jesus Christ is the only one who can bring us true freedom. So last week, Pastor Eric finished up chapter 5 with a challenge for us to be truly honest and, uh, with ourselves and to take inventory of our lives and to in evaluate how much of the fruit of the Spirit is really evident in it. And then the week before, I had the awesome privilege of sharing about the incredible freedom that we have in Christ and in Him alone. And that we need to be on guard not to lose this freedom by not falling into the trap of a works mentality. That we have been set free from the fear that we must always do the right things to keep God happy with us. But we have been set free for the Spirit to keep growing His image within us and causing His good works to flow out of us. And that it is truly about the grace of God working in and through us. So tonight we will start our last chapter as I'll be walking us through chapter 6 verses 1 through 10 and then Pastor Eric will be back next Wednesday to bring us the exciting finish of our journey through the book of Galatians. So before we get started, I'd like to pray for us and then we'll jump right in. Father, I just thank you so much for the honor and the privilege of sharing your word tonight. Holy Spirit, I invite you to lead us into your truth and in the direction that you want to take us. We are so thankful for the power of your word and the transforming power of your grace. And I just ask, Holy Spirit, that even though we are scattered and apart, that you would connect our hearts as one tonight as we dig into the truths of your incredible word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, if you haven't done so, please turn with me to chapter 6, verses 1 through 10, and I'll be reading from the NIV tonight, the New International Version. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If someone thinks that they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. And whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. Now one thing we need to remember, that in the original text there were no chapters or verses, so there were no pauses or breaks. This is just a letter from Paul to the Galatians. So keeping that in mind, in this short letter, Paul is taking us right from the truth that we had just learned about our freedom we have in Christ in chapter 5 to applying that same freedom 
in our relationships in chapter 6. What Paul is telling us here in these first couple of verses is that because of the grace of God, the Spirit can empower us to, re to respond contrary to how our sinful nature naturally would when we see someone sinning or is caught in a sin. In our natural sinful state, if we are truly honest, most of us would respond with a conceited superiority that would cause us to look down on the person caught in a sin. Or we would point out their sin merely to underline how good we would look in comparison. We would be quick to criticize and tell people their faults. When a Christian sins, we can easily fall into the temptation of pride. We commit this sin when we compare ourselves to those who have fallen morally and feel better than they. And to be truthful and transparent, I found myself doing this a few years ago. I was standing in a security checkpoint line at the Chicago O'Hara Airport, and it was summertime, so the line was extremely long. I was zigzagging through the line for about 20 minutes or so and seeing the same people over and over again. I then realized in my mind that I was starting to judge these people who I was seeing. That one was too tall. This one looked too short. That one was too heavy. This one had strange looking hair and that one just looked strange, period. And again, being honest and transparent, I was doing this so I would feel better about myself. And after I caught myself doing this, I then felt the Holy Spirit say to me that yes, they are all different, but I know them all personally. I know why they are the way they are. I know their stories and the joy and pain behind those stories. And I love each and every one of them. I then felt the conviction from the Holy Spirit and went from judging them to praying for them the rest of my time in that line. So the message that Paul is saying to the Galatians, and he said it back in Galatians 5.16, is let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. This is what he's referring to when he is saying that we who are spiritual or to those who live by the Spirit. He is not referring to some super spiritual group of elite Christians. He is saying this to ordinary Christians. That if you follow the desires of the Spirit, you don't ignore a situation when you see someone caught in a sin. You restore them gently. The Greek word for restore is kat artizdo. This, this was a term that was used for setting a dislocated bone back into its place. And a dislocated bone is extremely painful because it's not in its, in its designed natural relationship with the other parts of the body. To put a bone back in place will inevitably inflict pain, but it is a healing pain. So to restore gently would be to appeal to them about the painful reaping that comes from choosing to satisfy our fleshly desires. And again, in our natural, desire, uh, our natural desire would be to confront someone caught in a sin. But this could have devastating results. Because confrontation immediately makes us adversaries instead of brothers and sisters. And confrontation usually will force someone to defend themselves. So both of these attitudes are a recipe for failure. In the NIV, both Paul and Peter use the word appeal, which means to call near or invite. This approach has a much better chance of success. If you think about it, a doctor resetting a bone would have compassion for the pain the patient is experiencing and would want to help rather than to judge or criticize. An appeal is more clearly an act of love for them. So after Paul tells them uh, to gently restore someone, he then gives them a warning. He tells them that this gentleness will only come if you watch yourself, or you may also be tempted. This takes an act of humility, knowing that we can fall short just like them. This is difficult, but very practical advice. A pastor friend of mine once said that, 
The ones who are spiritual are the ones who know they can be tempted. Spiritual doesn't mean sinless. True, truly spiritual people are humble people. We won't be able to winsomely reach someone if we think we are not capable of similar or equal sin. If we come across that we are above the person, our air of superiority will come through and we will destroy, not restore. Appealing out of love to someone caught in a sin is a way to help them carry each other's burdens. When we help carry a crushing burden of the one who has fallen in sin, we fulfill the law of Christ, which is the principle of love. You know, let's, let's look at it another way. When placing Galatians 6.2, carry each other's burdens, and Galatians 5.13 and 14, where we are told to serve one another humbly in love and to love your neighbor as yourself alongside each other, it shows that to serve one another in love means to carry each other's burdens. And what this does is it brings that lofty concept of love down to earth and that we are not to let people carry their burdens alone. This is Paul very vividly and practically teaching how Christians should relate to each other. You cannot help with a burden unless you, come, unless you become very close to the burdened person, basically standing virtually in their shoes and putting your own strength under the burden so that its weight is distributed on both of you, lightening the load for the other. And this could also be Paul taking one last swipe at those Judaizers, the false teachers who were trying to get the Galatians to come under the law of Moses. These requirements had, had been described as a yoke or a burden. So now, connecting verse 5 to verse 2 helps explain an apparent contradiction in this section. How can we possibly carry each other's burdens, as verse 2 says, when each should carry their own load that verse five is talking about. And it's because load is not the same as burden. The Greek word translated burdens means a heavy weight, but the Greek word translated load is, refers to a kind of backpack. So verse five means that God is giving each of us a different set of, weakness, a different set of weaknesses, strengths, and gifts. These are our load, our responsibilities before God. It's also a common term for the cargo a ship was designed to carry. We are therefore not to compare ourselves to someone who has done less than us and feel a conceited pride, or someone who has done more and feel despair or envy. God has given each of us a different load to carry and to serve him with. Our task is to carry our own individual load, not someone else's, in a way that pleases God. So next, Paul issues a stern warning. Now some have called it the law of great returns. Paul uses one of the most familiar experiences in the history of humankind, the agricultural process of sowing and reaping. Whatever a man sows, he will also reap, verse 7. In farming or gardening, this is an absolute principle. And Paul wants us to see at least two aspects, a, aspects to it. First, whatever you sow, you will reap. If you sow tomato seeds, you will not get corn, no matter how much you want corn to grow. Second, whatever you sow, you will reap. Though the seed may lay in the ground to no apparent effect for a long time, it will eventually come up. This is not, it's not the reaping that determines the harvest, but the sowing. The law of sowing and reaping applies to us as believers. It's for us. So it has nothing to do with salvation. Since Paul has already taught the Galatians over and over again, that eternal life with the Father is based on faith in Christ alone, and that we are saved by faith and not by our good works. The reaping here is the decay and destruction of all the things in our present life. Bad marriages, 
lost jobs, broken families, a loss of sense of righteousness, peace, and joy from the Spirit in our daily lives. Romans 14, 17, 18, uh, 17 through 18 says this, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. In the first part of verse 8, we are told that whoever sows to please the flesh, from the flesh they will reap destruction. The New Living Translation says it this way, Those who live by... Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. Now, this warning, uh, this, this warning from Paul, must be read in light of the rest of his letter. He has already shown that the sinful nature is the part of the heart that wants to keep control by being our own Savior and Lord. Throughout this letter, Paul has indicated that Christians can and very often do fall back into the same kind of slavery to sin or into a works righteousness or mentality. And this, this happened to me for a good portion of my Christian life as I shared two weeks ago. Each of us, by our own thoughts, attitudes, and actions, is constantly planting for a future reaping. Time may pass before the crop ripens, but the harvest is inevitable. And I'd like to say that, that the first part of this verse is a warning, but the second part is a promise. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. When we surrender to the Spirit and trust the grace of God to work in our lives, then we will enjoy the approval and the assurance and the fulfillment and the joy of, of the Christian life now and know that it will continue beyond death. What an incredible promise. And I think most of us have a tendency to focus on the first part, the warning, and, and possibly use it to judge others. But I personally like to focus on the promise and rest in the confidence that I have in the Holy Spirit who lives inside of me, helping me on my journey. But on this journey, our day-to-day -day sowing requires us to not become weary in doing good, as verse 9 says. Paul is encouraging these young Christians not to lose heart, because just as inex inexperienced gardeners might fail to water or weed in their discouragement over the slow-growing seed, so Christians might fail to persevere in their service and ministry to others. And verse 10 is talking about this ministry to others when it says, Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially those in the family of faith. The believer is to do good to both believers and unbelievers, with believers having the priority. Now, Christians in that era suffered great economic hardships as a result of the rejection and persecution they faced. With no government-assisted programs, they had no one else to help them but other believers. Christians should be willing to help anyone in need, but caring for fellow believers is still a priority. And as we're getting ready to close out this, this book and this letter, the, the truth about grace and freedom, the incredible truth about grace and freedom. In the midst of this, here's Paul preaching, do good, help others, be givers, and so on. All of these are important uh, in the New Testament and still apply to us today. And I'd like to go on record here and say that since my time here at Baxter Road Bible Church, I have seen this local church go above and beyond in this area. That you have made it a priority to fulfill this mandate. And for what I have seen in my short time of being here, that you have done a phenomenal job at it. And I am truly blessed and honored to call this my church home and to be part of this church family. So thank you. Well, let's end there. Pastor Eric will be back next week to finish up this chapter and the book of Galatians. 
And I hope that through our study tonight that you have a clearer understanding of the message and the powerful lessons that Paul was communicating to the Galatians. But know that these same lessons can and still do apply to us today. Amen? Let's pray, church. Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for connecting our hearts and leading us into your truths. I pray that, there, that if there was just one person who might have been set free by the power of your word tonight, that it was worth it. I pray that you would help us all to learn to walk in a life of surrender to you and to allow your grace to continue to transform us and to, sow and, and to help us to sow good things into our lives so that we can reap an incredible harvest. I also want to say thank you. Thank you for Baxter Road Bible Church and for allowing me to be part of this awesome church family. I pray these things now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us here. Thank you, Pastor Frank, for a great message. Thank you, Phil and crew, for taking time and leading us in worship. We're so blessed by that. If you have any needs or prayer requests or whatever, please email us, info at baxterroad.org. Call us, 337-5222. Contact us via the website or via the Facebook uh, page. We'd love to get in contact with you. We love you. We're praying for you. We care for you. And we will see you next, this coming Sunday at 10 a.m. Uh, as Pastor John preaches and kicks us off in a new series. So excited about that. So we'll see you on Sunday at 10 a.m. Love you, church.